AI founders, uh, you guys do more of uh, B2B sales. So it's a business, uh, your customers are businesses or banks, and it takes much longer sales cycle. So did you see any specific changes around that? And how did you uh, handle that in, in the last, uh, I would say, six to nine months uh, from that perspective? Um, I can start. Um, as you as you would know, right? Uh, in the the first part of uh, the COVID crisis, the banks, you know, generally went into what they call as a BCP mode, uh, where uh, most of uh, sort of the buying in the initial days kind of stopped. So I think we as a team and and, and I echo what Nikki said, right? Uh, adapted to the situation. Um, the team spent a lot of time understanding uh, what do our clients need. Uh, to make uh, these sort of engagements happen. So instead of just selling our product, we went on understanding what do they need, and we as a team can sort of customize, change the product to adapt to that need. And uh, it always says, right, a product market fit is not one thing, it's a continuous cycle. And that kind of amplified what we did. We understood what they need. In a COVID situation, scams, frauds went up, being able to federate those ideas into a single place where sharing of information can happen really aligned with our B2B customers. And that actually helped us sort of continue the engagement and not just get stopped. Um, so as a founder, you know, I would always ask budding people to kind of not think product market fit as a, a, a one point, but a continuous line over, uh, over time so that you can adapt and kind of deliver to what clients need. That's very... Richard, that's, that's really interesting, um, especially around, you know, the forging those partnerships. I think it's important. Uh, and Abhishek, you just announced a, a recent partnership, which uh, I'm sure was on the works already, but how do you, how do you continue um, those, uh, uh, those partnerships and selling into, into, into banks or, or, or other types of financial services during this BCP mode that, you, that was described earlier? Um, the way I kind of think about it is that uh, uh, building AI products, especially in financial crime, is some sort of a evangelical sell because um, regulators around the world haven't seen AI-based AML products, uh, neither banks or neither financial institutions. So being able to have initial champions um, who can who has actually gone over your product, you know, in production parallel for almost a year and uh, sharing their experiences of how the product worked, how AI has actually helped them in tackling financial crime makes a lot of difference because when you have these sort of champions and case studies, that allows the ecosystem to kind of grow up and then take those chances. Uh, so from, from my point of view, right, being able to kind of create and build those champions who can really help you create those case studies and then use that to enable others is the way that you can scale. And that's what we have been lucky with a few of our champions who were great ambassadors of our product. And that's how, you know, we have seen that our product has really scaled, not just locally, but, you know, across the region and primarily in the North American markets as well. So case studies and strong champions were key to our success managed to go ex expand um, outside of the region dur during this period? Um, the way we have, as uh, I think as Richard said, right, one of the things that we initially did was, um, you know, we asked our team members that they can work from uh, you know, home and they don't need to be, uh, be in Singapore or be in, in, in office. So everybody in it was in a distributed environment. So, you know, a lot of our team members who were originally from the North American markets, they were there. You know, a few of us was in India, a few of them were in, you know, you know Taiwan, multiple regions. And what has really happened is that when, uh, you know, teams started to work in a distributed environment and they are in their locations, um, we have seen a lot of uh, traction happening because then you can speak the common language, especially in a business like us, which is highly sort of regulated, mm -hmm. having somebody locally speaking that language made a huge difference. So we have seen, you know, sort of a lot of growth in North American markets, as well as countries in Asia where our team members were there and were able to make a dent. If, if it's so 
awesome to have distributed are you ever going to go back to the old old model or you going to continue is the decentralized uh, way of uh, working and operating your company with having ambassadors with local language and everything is that going to be future for you i mean are you going to go back and uh, what does this mean for a hub like singapore like if if that is normal then would you see the role of how singapore brings together people and stuff so where do you how do you see the what's the default state after this after the vaccine is raining from the skies and everybody has it what happens then so varun uh, is trying to trip me but <laughs> the way i look at it is um, as satya said right um social capital is very important team kind of coming together and actually being a team is uh, is as important as sort of a distributed environment so the way i look at it is a hybrid mode where uh, team should have the flexibility to come together and bond as a team as well as the flexibility of working in a distributed environment so a hybrid strategy is we in tukitaki is kind of trying to create there's no playbook for it but what we are trying to see is there a way that we can have more um offsites right at uh, at our locations almost like twice a month right so that we, the team can get together but i strongly believe that the social capital of coming together you know kind of unites the team so we need to have that as well as the flexibility to have a distributed team we i kind of uh, looked into the issue was that uh, in the early days we we took certain decisions about how we wanted to grow our business meaning we had a plan now one of the things that you know we learned early on in the business as you know i think uh, richard had pointed out um running a early stage company it's like a sinusoidal curve at one point you're high and then the second point you don't know you're at the bottom right so you just need to understand what is your end goal what is that goal post and just work through that now in that journey what we realized is that uh, on one side definitely you cannot be aggressive you have to be cost conscious but on the other side if you get into some sort of a hibernation mode especially b2b companies um either you are then beaten out by you know global companies who have a bigger budget larger team um or by you know internal sort of team members of the banks who are also trying to build that internally in house so we took a decision that we would be very conscious about how we would grow higher and build the team but we also took the decision that we do not want to get into a hibernation mode so that 6 months down the lane when you know the banks get out of that bcp mode we are not prepared because we realize that we need to speak to our customers and the way customers going to use a product would be quite different from what they used to do in a pre covid situation so there a lot of work has to be done so we i would say took a more aggressive stance to sort of uh, revamp our product uh, grow the team uh, and uh, and and of course do that in a very cost conscious way not in a aggressive way but we never went into a hibernation mode that is actually paying up for us because when the client realized that you know these guys actually spent time with us they did not pitch our product they talked about the need and now once i am in a better state uh, they are coming back and saying hey we heard you and now you have the product they are they are giving us much more time that than they would have given in a pre covid situation so taking that approach of not co- completely going under the burrow being cost conscious and still kind of focusing on the product in this downtime was some sort of strategic decisions we as a team took and i would say when i say we like everybody in the team supported that and that's why we are where we are right the your the, the opportunities in southeast asia are, are are large and we're having a lot of fintechs uh, international fintechs come to singapore um what would be your advice for fintechs coming from um from the us or from europe or or, or anywhere uh, that are setting up in uh, in southeast asia and singapore Let's start with you, Abhishek. <laughs> um, a couple of things, right? If you are in the the B two B space, um, we have to realize that you know when 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 you come to Singapore or in Asia, uh, every country will have their own nuance, their culture, uh, their buying process, and it's not the same. Uh, too many times I've seen like um, younger early stage companies from uh, US or Europe right they think if they come to Singapore they can win all the markets surrounding um, that doesn't happen 
uh, that nuance has to be understood well. That's one. And number two um, is, you know, the the way you know the sales process works in the in the local market is a bit different from the North American market. So just to give you some example, here you know you know the investments on an early stage company generally goes through a validation process, which means that the the sales time might be much higher than you know any sort of uh, other places in the world. So when sort of these early stage companies come here. They need to understand that it's going to be a journey and it's not going to be quite transactional, which would be very key for success in the region.